we'll set that up, get everybody recording. And Melinda, you ready to go? I yes. lost. Oh, I lost you. I thought you left. <laughs> nope, I'm here. All right, here we go. All right, we're going to set up for live streaming. All right, very exciting. We have Melinda Elmer in our group today for Mastermind with Neil Schwartz. We've got a big group today, good information, great stuff. Well, Melinda, you there? Yes, I'm here. Great, excellent. Welcome to our group officially. You're part of our group on a regular basis, but this is our Mastermind group. So what I'd like to do is if you would take a minute or two and share with the group uh, your, the kind of the Reader's Digest version, where you at, what some of the production is, um, kind of what's going on in your world today. Um, I have been in business for 18 years now. I can't believe that. Um, but um, so this is my yeah, 18th year in business. Um, I'm with your company, obviously, and um, working in the Long Beach and surrounding areas. And um, Last year, I did 86 transactions and was my first seven-figure year. Broke a million. Um, so very exciting on that. And um, I guess that's the Reader's Digest version um, of where I'm at right now. So your business comes from expireds, for sale by owners, past clients, fear. Where, where, where does that happen to come from for you? These days, it's primarily past clients and center of influence and um, other sources here and there, but um, primarily past clients and center influence right now. Got it, got it. And uh, you were in a different business before real estate, right? Yes. What did, what did you do that? I was a theatrical stage manager previous to this. Okay, so it's a perfect setting to become a great real estate agent, right? Right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, the big thing was I really wanted to buy a house. And I talked to a real estate agent. Now that I think about it, they were probably wearing a gold jacket. So they were probably Century 20, 21 agent. I bumped into them in a mall kiosk. Um, and I talked to them and they sat me down and they said, well, you need to buy a condo. And I said, I don't want to buy a condo. I want to buy a house. I don't care where it is. I don't care what kind of shape it's in. I want to buy a house. And they just kept pushing me to buy that condo. And I didn't want to buy a condo. So me being who I am, I said, okay, well, I'm going to figure this out myself since this person wasn't listening to me. And um, I said, I'm, I'm going to go look online. And this was back in probably 2000. So the internet was still fairly young. Um, but I found the HUD Home Golden Feather website. And I started looking up properties on there. And I was like, great, this is exactly what I'm looking for. These houses are completely beat up, totally trashed. It was perfect for me. And I even went and saw some of them, but I couldn't make offers unless I had a real estate license. So hopefully my son's not being too loud. Um, so I couldn't make any offers. So I said, well, I better go get a real estate license so that I can make offers on these properties. So I went into this company and they, I did all like correspondence class type system, sent it all in, took my test, passed, but as I was taking the classes, I started thinking, hey, there's a lot of correlation to what I liked about theater stage management versus real estate in that I saw it as bringing together people who had different goals, personalities, all of that, and bringing Balance. them together and making a cohesive deal. Right. And that's basically what I did in theater was I brought all of these people together who sometimes argued, who sometimes fought, whatever. But my job was to bring everybody together and have cohesive communication between everybody. So I thought, well, that's what I like about this. I could do this other thing and potentially make more money and be able to buy my house. So, so I made the leap and, and switched over and here I am. So, so what year was that? More or less. 
Well, I started that whole process in 2000, but I, it took me two, three years before I finally got my license. So I got my license in 2003. Got it. Okay. And, um, and so you made the leap. Where did business come from for you at that time? Well, when I, so I went to school at University of Illinois, and then I worked in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So I followed a girl back out here and um, moved back to Long Beach, and I knew no one. Um, <laughs> not at all. Um, we, we, I, because I worked nights and she worked days, we barely even saw each other. It was probably for the better. Um, but, um, <laughs> We, we didn't really get a chance to get out and meet anybody because my only days off were Mondays. So didn't know anybody. The people I did know worked in theater, had no money, um, or they were lived all over the country. So I really didn't have a, a base. So when I started, um, I, I was actually still working in theater. My first transaction was my brother. He purchased a condo in North Hills, which is in the northern part of LA County, not anywhere near Long Beach. I actually was driving 70 miles back and forth to show him property and it stressed me out. I don't think I slept for six weeks because I was so worried that I was going to screw something up or do something wrong for him. Um, but we ended up finding him a property. He ended up buying it and he lived there for a number of time and I didn't screw anything up too terribly. So that's good. Um, but what I realized, and that was my first six months, I only did one transaction. And I wow. thought, I got my first check and it was like $2,000. And I went, this sucks. Um, I worked- Houston, we have months. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for six months and I got a check for two grand. This is not what I had envisioned real estate to be about. Um, and I said, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And at that point, uh, my title rep, who I still work with today, she introduced me to Mike Ferry, and I went to a, a, the free action workshop that he had, the big in, giant one. That in Long Beach, to. right? Yep, yep. And yeah. I went there, and I, my friends, I carpooled with my friends. We were late. We sat in the very back row, and I was pissed that we were late because I hate being late. Um, but we were in the very back row, but I felt like Mike was talking to me sitting in that back seat, back row seat. And I said, finally, somebody's telling me what I need to do because all of the agents in my office were big Brian Buffini people. Um, they were all going out and buying pies for all their friends to convince them to sell their home. And I was like, I don't have any friends. I don't have any money to go buy pies for people or pumpkins for my neighbors. I, I borrowed $6,000 from my dad so that I could, um, live and I quit my other job. I basically burned the ships, no going back. And I just said, okay, I've got $6,000. I need to make this happen. And I started doing, I signed up for, I ran to the back of the room at the break. So I said, I don't have any money, but what can I sign up for? <laughs> and they put me in the Mike Frey sales system at the time, which I think was 250 bucks a month. And I did everything that my coach said. Um, I just took total blind faith and said, okay, what do I have to do? And I just kept doing what they said. And, um, within three months I had taken four or five listings. I think I had four or five things under contract or listings. I can't remember exactly. Um, and as soon as my first closing happened, I switched to the premier coaching, um, and have been in it ever since. Fantastic. Great story. So, how did your, and you were doing a lot of buyer's deals at that time, right? I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My first transaction actually, so what I did in the beginning, because I didn't know anybody, I was doing just listed, just sold calls all day long. This was 2003. There were almost no expireds. Sounds familiar. Um, for sale by owners, again, non-existent, or they were selling the second that they would put a sign up in the yard. Um, so I was going around my office and saying, Hey, do you have any buyers that you don't want to work with any buyer leads? And agents were just giving me buyer leads all the time. So I was like, Hey, that'll pay the bills. I'm good with that. 
So my very first listing came because I was doing hot buyer calls. I was calling and saying, hey, I've got a buyer who's looking for a home in your neighborhood. Right. Who do you know? Just thinking about moving. And they said, well, we're actually thinking about it. So I went out, sat down with them, listed it, and they bought another condo. So and that's how it, that's how it built. So the so your yeah. first year, eight, 10, will, and eight, 10 deals? My first year, I did 12 transactions. 12 deals. Okay. And then, so how did the progression go? Because when we met, which was what, six years ago now, five years ago? Well, we actually, I think, met well before that at Mike Ferry events, but like we didn't really sit down and talk okay. until five or six years ago. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, but up till that time, a lot of your business was still buyer deals. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so what was the most, so up until what year was that with, if it was five years ago, um, we met in, um, uh, I don't know. In Can Vegas. You, right. But 2015, 2014. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. And how many deals were you doing at that time? About, uh, I was stuck at like 45 transactions. Right. And, and a lot of that was by, a lot of that was buyer sides, right? A lot of it was buyer sides. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. That's how I remembered it. Um, and then you decided to shift gears, uh, join us and you created two or three different goals. Uh, you want to walk, you wanted to make a million dollars a year. You wanted to get married and you wanted to have a baby. Right. right? And buy investment property. And buy one or two investment properties, right? right. So th that was the goal. So we we set yeah out in a plan to do that, but it didn't happen in the first or second year. It took a process. So to walk me through the process. So when when I switched over to your company, I was very stuck at like forty, just under fifty. I would keep missing fifty every year, um, and we just kept started to look at how we could. Um, changed me into focusing more on listings. And I Which was, was a challenge to my buyers. Yeah. <laughs> because, because, because you are a great buyer's agent. Yeah, I was But very you had good. to become a spectacular listing agent to make the transition. Right, right. right. And I had to let go of that control of the buyers. Right. And at the time I had a buyer's agent, but I was still... She was just doing more of kind of covering for me, but I was still trying to do it all. Right. And there was just no way that I could do both well all the time. Um, and like, even I worked with Robert and Robert even forbade me at some one point from showing property at all. Right. Um, I still had a hard time letting go of that, but, but I definitely have, have let that go more and more. Um, so because that time is more valuable for me to go out and show property right now means that I could potentially lose a listing because I'm not looking for other people during that time. So, and that listing, those listings right now are really critical for us to feed those buyers that we're working with. Right. So the more listings that I can take, if we have those buyers, then we can match them up and put them in with each other and right. create our own inventory for our own buyers to buy. Okay. So you're, so going back four or five years, uh, how big was your database at the time? Probably 500, I think. Okay. And how big is it now? Um, close to a thousand. Right. Okay. And you built it over that period of time looking for those, those transactions, right? Right. Right. Cause it was zero. Well, it was, I won't say it was zero because I actually put in back in 18 years ago, I put in all my theater friends from all over the country. And I actually probably paid for my coaching my first three years of business by calling all my friends all over the country and saying, hey, who do you know that's thinking about making a move wherever you are? And I was referring people all over the country. Um, so all my friends used all my referral agent sources all over all all over the place. So I think I paid for my coaching just doing that. So how big is your team, Melinda? I have a transaction coordinator, a 
director of operations slash office manager and a buyer's agent. And then just this last year, we have brought on four showing assistants. Right. And the showing assistants get paid per showing, not they're not salaried or anything Correct. like that, right? Correct. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so, they have their so, own businesses and they do their own thing, but right. they help us with um, with showings. So yeah. we pay them per showing. Per <clears throat> showing. Good. Okay. So so let's let's go back to the goals and the things that we're trying to uh, achieve. So in 2019, how many deals did you do? 2019, I did 52 transactions, but I also took four months off and had a baby. Right. Okay. And got married too in there someplace, right? The end of 2018, yes. Right. Okay. All right. So, um, so you actually went backwards slightly in production. I think right. you hit... You hit I around did 67 eight, transactions in 2018. In 18, right. And then 19, you went backwards slightly. You had the baby, you took some time off. You ran, and then you set yourself up to ramp up for 2020. And then COVID hit. Right. Okay. So how did that, how did that, um, how did that affect you? It affect your business at, at that time? What, what went through your head then? It affected me almost not at all. Okay. Um, there was the week, the week before everything shut down, I told my team, I said, you know what? I can see the writing on the wall. Everybody go home, work from home, take what you need, you know, whatever. Just go set yourself up at home. I'll see you in two months, right? Because I figured right. it was, everybody thought it was going to be short term, right? Uh-huh. Um, we all set up in our dining rooms and stuff like that. Since then, we've all gotten desks and fancy equipment and stuff like that. But initially, I was in my dining room on a plastic folding table. I don't recommend it. Um, so, so I remember then that week, that Friday, our board of realtors sent out a email that said, shut it down. Don't do anything. That's it. I called you at nine. They sent that out at like 845 that night. I think I called you at nine o'clock and you said, let's talk about this in the morning. And I said, okay. And then I went to sleep. Um, I woke up that next morning. We talked and you said, it's just a recommendation. They can't force you to stop working. They can't do anything. Um, you know, unless a law comes down and says, don't do this. It's just a recommendation. And so that more, that day I called on my team and I said, you know what? If you guys aren't comfortable going out into the world and doing stuff, I totally respect that, you know, but I'm going to, I'm, our clients need us. They need our help. And we have people who are moving next week. So we can't just stop. And we had like 10 things in escrow. So we couldn't just stop doing anything. All those people needed to move forward and they were moving, they had moving trucks coming and, and stuff like that. So I said, if you guys don't feel comfortable going out, that's fine. I will. Um, but they all said, nope, we're fine. You know, we're obviously take precautions, but um, our people need us. So we're willing to step up and make it happen. And so you did. We did. And we only really had that 12 hour period where I was like, what are we going to do? And, but talking to you certainly helped just kind of go, okay, well, let's just keep doing what we need to do until someone forces me to stop. I'm going to keep going. Right. Well, that was the philosophy and that's what we did. That's what we did with the entire organization and it's paid off handsomely. Um, okay. So 2020, your single best production year ever. Right. However, you're looking at it as only the floor for the rest of your future. Right. It's new minimum standard. New minimum standard. Talk to me about that. What's going on? Um. Well, we're looking at bringing on an additional admin person to help support um, because right now we're a little bit maxed out, I think. Like we're putting seven listings on the market this week and it's a little bit much, um, especially right now because the inventory is so low. My phone has been blowing up since we put three places on the market yesterday and it's going to be just nuts. Um, but I don't answer every phone call, so that helps so I can keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. 
but it definitely overwhelms my admin staff. Um, so we're working on that. And then I'm just continuing to look at ways to streamline everything that I'm doing so that I can be more efficient and that my job is truly just going on appointments, um, negotiating contracts and um, prospecting. Got it. So um, you're, are you that organized by nature? Is that your superpower, so to speak? Yes, I think so. I remember as a kid, I used to have lists and a schedule. It would say like, get up, you know, brush teeth, <laughs> go to the bathroom, you know, all that stuff. I mean, I wait, I've i always been a list maker when I was very young uh -huh. um, and I work well that way. But I would actually say my superpower, because I've been thinking about what my superpower was since you asked, um, is actually listening. That was my biggest frustration when I was trying to buy a house way back when. And so I'm always really carefully listening to what the client wants and not trying to push them in something that they don't want or want to do. And if they're not, if it's not a good decision for them based on what they told me they want, I'll be the first to tell them that. You, you said it many times where you said, walk into that listing appointment and say, do you have an option of keeping this property? And most of the time they're not going to have that option, but just coming from that place of listening to what's right for them and doing the right thing for them, I think brings more business back to me than anything else um, because people know that I'm always looking out for their best interests. Okay, great, excellent. So um, tell me, this year, your goal is what? That you're... 120. 120. Okay. And on 120, what's that? A million and a half, a million six, something like that? Yeah. I think right now my numbers analyzer says a million six. Can you make a living in Long Beach and, and pay the rent and, and uh, go to dinner? and? Yes, just a little bit. Okay, good. All right. So... So that, that's cool. All right, so you, you um, what advice, you know, you, we're, we're working together. I mean, we, a little different kind of an interview here because we talk two or three times a week. I'm involved with your team. Robert's involved with you, involved with your team, et cetera. So it's a little, we have a little bit more of an insight, but if you were, if you're talking to our group, which you do quite often, you're very, very, uh, gracious about that and we appreciate it what's the two or three things that you would have them do right now over the next say 90 days that would make a dramatic difference in their business one of the things made a couple notes um one of the things that that i think that would be really helpful for, for everyone is Think about the people that are in your database. Think about the people that you do know and who might do something and focus on calling those people first. I know you talk about two bedroom, two bath condos all the time. I've been looking through anybody who had a, bought a condo, one bedroom, two bedroom, whatever, that might be bursting at the seams. Uh, a lot of my Corona babies People have been getting pregnant, having babies right now because they have nothing else to do. And Corona babies have made me a lot of money this year. So, um, but you don't know that people are pregnant or things like that if you don't call them and talk to them. So just really combing through the database to see who might be able to do something, who might right. be looking at investments, who might um, be again, needing more space and expanding, who's been in a condo for more than two, three, four years at this point that might need to go. Or, you know, if I know people who've been working in retail or for restaurants or things like that that have been affected, I'm reaching out to them, checking on and make sure they're doing okay. Can I help them with anything? So really digging that extra deeper. I know we talked about, the, they talked about that retreat, digging further within your database. I think that's a really critical thing to look at of who in there are you skipping? Who are you missing right now? But they could be doing something right now. 
Good. Uh, the other thing is finding future listings. So um, we have seven listings coming on the market just this week, but most of those listings I've taken anywhere from November to last week. Not all of them I took this last week, but some of them needed to finish some work in, prop in the property. Some of them needed to do some upgrades. Some of them needed to pack up their house because they were imploding with stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that people needed to do to be ready. Or maybe they weren't going to find out about a job situation until now. So we took the listing then and said the listing would expire 180 days from the time that it went on the market. So basically we had the listing until, until they were ready. Until they were um, ready. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes we get locked into that it has to be somebody who's going on the market tomorrow, but it doesn't. It can be somebody who's a future listing and get them to sign it now. And then, you know, I, I'm there for advice. I'm there for recommending contractors. I'm there for all of that stuff up front. And the way we do our listings most of the work on them right now is all up front anyway. Then the little bit of time we're on the market. And then by the time we have an offer accepted, it's pretty much just smooth sailing until we close. Are so, you? No, yeah. go, go ahead. So so do you do, uh, we, we uh, I don't know, we're on the seven right now. Are you doing the inspections up front and the yes. three limbs? Okay, so talk about, talk a little bit about that. Cause that was, that was a, a game changer for you a couple of years ago when we started to have you do that on a regular basis. Right. Um, well, we had talked about it and I really was like, yeah, I can recommend it to people, but I wasn't really pushing it and telling people they needed to do it. But then a year and a half ago, we had a property that we put on the market. We had multiple offers on it. Buyer came in, did their inspections, and we found out the foundation was shot. Right. It completely needed to be replaced. $50,000 repair. Seller didn't have that. So we had to sell it as is. We had to go back on the market, drop the price significantly, sell it to a cash buyer. Well, that experience, because we wasted so much time with that, made me say to all my sellers, you know what? This is what we recommend. And the great thing is the contract actually now has that, where it says the seller has given us permission to order a structural pest control, uh, general inspection report, HOA documents, all that stuff. And where does most, I, I looked at, it, I said, where does most of the time get wasted in a transaction? It gets wasted because we put it on the market, we go under contract, then the buyer comes back and fights us back and forth on repair requests and nickel and dimes the poor seller. And now we don't have those 10 or 15 other offers that we're competing with. So now we've got only one person and now they're beating us up and the seller takes it. I don't want that for my sellers. I want it to be a good, smooth, easy transaction. And for me, because I don't, the, the biggest time Western, I hated repair requests. They <laughs> were the biggest waste of time because we were constantly fighting. They're coming back and asking for five, $10,000 or whatever, which if we were still in that multiple offer situation, they would never do. Right. So um, after that foundation house, we started making everyone do it. They do a, if it's a house, they do a termite inspection and a general inspection. And if the general inspection calls out, we have a lot of 1920s and 1930s houses in Long Beach. They almost always call out foundation issues. We have our foundation guy come out. He looks at it, gives us a quote, but then we give this big package to the buyers when we have multiple offers and say, here's all the disclosures and reports you're buying this as is with no additional repairs and or credits or price reductions. And, um, and ideally you're waiving your inspection contingency because we've just given you everything. And the, the sellers paying for the inspection up front, four, five, six hundred dollars $600. But the idea there was structured in such a way that if they did it the other, the traditional way, that they could be facing three, four, eight, ten, fifteen thousand dollars worth of repairs. That right. now they're not, you know, for five hundred bucks, it's kind of like an insurance policy. That's it. Here's your house. Right. Instead of renegotiating later with right. all that other stuff, and and I don't even and and I I've learned 
that I still have to couch with that the buyers may still come back and ask. But we have a lot more authority and power to say, no, you already knew about this beforehand. You're not getting anything. Right. Right. Now, that's great. That, that's awesome. Fantastic. Um, all right. It does create more work up front, but, um, but it definitely pays for itself in the end. I think, I, I think we talked about, you're, you were saying it, it's kind of a good customer service thing because the experience is a better experience. Oh, my clients client. rave about it. They yeah. say, thank you so much. This was such a smooth transaction. We were so worried that it was going to be this big drama. And I mean, everybody, I think the sellers all think that they have to fix all of these things. Um, and and part of what I tell, they call me all the time. They're like, well, do we need to fix all these things on this inspection report? And I said, no, you just need to give this information to them so that they're aware of it and they're choosing to move forward or not based on this information. Got now, it. There might be times we had a property that has a vacant, it's, it's basically vacant, but they had a pool and the pool was empty. And I said, you need to fill that pool because the only people who can buy it with an empty pool is a cash buyer. Now there's other issues, but that particular property, we said you have to fill the pool or, or it's not gonna work. Right. So, I mean, those kinds of things, yes, we'll tell them to do, but if it's, if it's gonna cause a major issue with the property or they're gonna have to be aware that it's their choice, ultimately. They can choose not to fill the pool, but they're gonna deal with a cash buyer who's gonna pay them a lot less. Got it. So we got a, we have a, someone asked a question in the chat. Um, let's see, it was, um, what does your daily schedule look like? Well, let me do this one first. Do the, up, uh, do the upfront disclosures include ballpark cost estimates for repairs or you just leave that to the, to the buyer? Here, these are the problems, go check it out. It depends on what the repairs are. Foundation stuff, yes, generally we include that foundation repair because people tend to inflate how much a foundation would cost. But little things like GFCI plugs or, you know, yeah, it just depends on what it is. If it's something that we look at the inspection report and skim through it, and if we see something that's a really big ticket item, we're going to probably get a bid for it. If not, then little stuff, no. Okay, cool. All right. So um, uh, Kevin asked um, what your daily schedule looks like, more or less, just the Reader's Digest. Sure. Um, in my ideal world, if my son is cooperating, he's 18 months old, um, then I would get up at 445 and um, do a workout, um, do a meditation, um, some journaling, stuff like that. My son is not always cooperative and he tends to like wake up at four. And so my first priority is to get him to sleep until six. So <laughs> if I can, sometimes that means I have to hold him until he goes back to sleep and then I'm holding baby. So then I'll just take the snuggle time instead. Um, but then six o'clock I get ready, feed him, feed family, all that good stuff. We do everything. Um, our nanny shows up at 7.30, we hand him off. And then I come in and start, I just sit down, plan out my day a little bit, make sure I have lists of people I need to call for that day, have everything ready to go. Um, I generally try to hop on our role play at 8.30 and um, eight and nine o'clock I start prospecting or nine to 9.30. I do open mic usually at 9.30 when I can. And then, um, open mic for anybody who doesn't know is our role play. We just do prospecting on our group. And then um, I meet with my team twice a week. So we meet um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays so that we get everything done there. I do a training for my showing assistants on Wednesdays. Every Wednesday afternoon, I call all the current clients. That's starting to bleed into Tuesdays and Thursdays as well because I have 18 to 20 current escrows or things kind of going at any given point in time. So it's starting to give away. Can't call them all in one afternoon. Um, and then I have listing appointments at four o'clock in the afternoon. Fantastic. And I'm done That's by five thirty. So uh, let's talk just for a minute uh, about open mic. Um, that's where 25 to 40 agents are listening to you or somebody prospecting for 30 minutes, right? 
look, does that help you? I mean, is that, does that help focus you for that period of time? Yes. Um, I actually, at the beginning of this year, I was struggling a little bit. And one of the accountabilities I made with my coach was that I was going to schedule the week and I had to do uh, an open mic as much as I can every day. That way, because it makes me sit down and do it because I know everybody else is watching. They may not be, they may not care. They may have me turned down completely, but um, I think everybody else is watching. So it gives, puts that extra pressure for me to um, prospect. Yeah. One of the most powerful things I think one can do is to, I call it the show off factor. Right. Okay. And um, I, I think that's great. Fantastic. I, I love that you use it and use it in that way. Um, oh, here's a, here's a question. How do you, or did you manage your cold calling when you had the, your son? Um, well, when he was first born, I took six weeks, eight weeks off, um, from work and, um, but I was still calling at that point. He was super young and he slept all the time. So I just made calls. Like, I'm pretty sure that my voice lulled him to sleep because I would just, I mean, even when I was pregnant, he was like, he would move more when I wasn't prospecting and he would fall asleep when I was. So he liked, he likes the sound of my voice apparently. Um, now he's a little older and it's definitely more challenging. I'm very fortunate that I have a nanny who comes to our house from 7.30 until five every day and can help take care of him during the day. But um, like this evening, for example, I have a appointment at five o'clock on the phone uh, to do a consultation and uh, my wife isn't gonna be here. So, but I'm gonna be watching him and doing it at the same time. I'm probably unashamedly gonna stick him in front of the TV <laughs> so he can watch TV <coughs> for a few minutes while I do that consultation. Um, and he'll probably sit in my lap while I do that. But um, Luckily, these people are past clients and they have a small child as well. So I think right now people are a lot more understanding um, of that. And I've had calls where my son has run in the room while I'm on a listing Zoom meeting and I'm like, hey, where's my son? Um, but I think people have a much more understanding that that's going to happen right now and that they're going to hear kids in the background. And I've done plenty of calls with clients where my son is shrieking in my ear. And they're like, oh, it's your son, you know, whatever. But um, I think just the level of understanding people have is much higher right now. Fantastic, very good. So Melinda, you open for a couple questions right now. We're starting to get to the top of the hour. Absolutely. Okay, good. All right, so uh, let's open it up a little bit for some live questions and then we'll go back to the chat view and there's some questions in there. So- Yeah, I see a couple of the questions in the chat. Like, um, the one in person asks what my daily schedule looks like, call or text people, I call. I do send some texts, but it's primarily people I already know. Um, I, don't, I don't go on Facebook. I don't even know how to go on Instagram. And uh, LinkedIn is just doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, so, but I do have a marketing person who does stuff on that, but I don't even know what she does, frankly, because I don't go on them anymore. I'm very careful about what I put in my brain. And I found that Facebook was not serving me. So I just don't really go on there. Um, da, 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 script early presentation, like, oh, on the script for the presentation for in advance, the only real difference that I'm, I use the Mike Ferry script, the only real difference is that I say that we may adjust the pricing and revisit the pricing as we get closer. Um, I have done cases where I've said, um, we're gonna be in this ballpark where I say like, uh, we're gonna be from, you know, 650 to 700 and give them that range if we're a month or two out. But if not, I just use what the market is right now and we can always adjust later. Okay. Um, Cherry, I'll answer your question privately. Um, Tim, let's see, any question, pushback? No, I really don't. I explained the benefits of it about doing the pre-sale inspections and stuff. And in most cases, unless they're hiding something, then um, they don't have a problem with it. Sometimes they're afraid that they were gonna find things that they didn't know about. 
But when I explain to them that the buyers are going to find it anyway, so we might as well find it now while we have multiple offers, then none, they, they do it. Uh, do I still cold call expired for sale by owner? Um, yes, but not as much as I have in the past. Um, to answer that question, activities for transition. Oh, activities, you know what? The activities for transitioning from buyer's agent to listing agent. Um, this is, I did role play accountability and I started practicing my listing presentation all the time. Um, at one point I did it two, two times a day at first. I was doing role play and script practice on my listing presentation specifically. I remember that, um, I'm blanking on his name, Tony Smith. Tony Smith talked about how we practice our other scripts all the time, but we would only practice our listing presentation once or twice a week. And I thought he's right. So I need to practice it every day. So I started practicing it twice a day and I still do role play. Uh, Robert mentioned before that I did a role play with him at 1130 on Thursdays and I record it and watch it and critique it and work on it and tweak it. And, um, and then I do another role play with Jack Ma on Fridays and just, I just set up that I have different role plays during the week. Um, I don't do it as much as I did when I was really focused and concentrated, but I'm also going on two, three listing appointments a week right now too. Good stuff. Um, okay, so live questions. Yeah. Uh, Do you have push notifications on your phone? No, I turned them all off. Uh, I just wanted to remind people of that. <laughs> Anything that was annoying me, I got rid of. Push notifications for what? Off. I used to get my Google Voice, because um, that's my business line. I used to get all my text messages would go into my email, and it was bogging everything down. I turned it off. So now I just get texts when I look at it every once in a great while now. And usually my um, office manager take care of, takes care of all of them for me. So I don't have to do as much texting either. Okay, good. Other questions for Melinda? Quick question. What does a director for operations slash manager do? Like I would everything. like to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's another word for everything. <laughs> she pretty much does everything other than listing appointments, negotiation. I, frankly, she does, she doesn't do negotiations specifically, but she goes out and gets bids for things. She's scheduling contractors. She's scheduling all the inspections. She schedules photos. She inputs the listings. She does pretty much everything else. That's not listing appointments, prospecting or um, negotiating. All right, good question, Abigail, thanks. Other questions for Melinda? I have a question. Go ahead, Tess. Hi, Melinda, thank you Hi. for sharing. Um, in reference to the inspection, going back to the inspection, how do you overcome where, I just wanna know how to overcome that objection of the seller where you act, they actually will have to pay that inspection upfront, whether, so sometimes you know how like some sellers, they like to sell, but they don't wanna really spend that kind of money. How do you overcome that objection to the seller? It, I mean, it's really, do you, would you prefer to know all, so, so Tess, I highly recommend that we get a full inspection of your entire property before we go on the market. Would you like to know why? Yes. So what happens is in this market, we're getting four, five, six offers on your property, maybe more. Right. So would you think it would be better to negotiate any repairs up front with those four, five, six offers when maybe they'll waive everything? Or would you rather have it when we only have one buyer who can really grind you back down on, on your price or terms? Which would be better for you? Well, I'd like to know now and know what's the expense. Exactly. So the good news is it for you, it only costs about $350 to have a, have a full inspection done on your home versus five, $10,000 in repairs that a buyer might ask for. So would you rather spend the $350 now or lose $10,000 more later? Okay. So as far as the inspection, when you're dealing with the selling agent, 
do you, since you give them all the reports, and do you upfront remove that inspection already? And let Ideally, them yes. Huh? The biggest pushback I get from agents is they say, well, they want to do their own inspection. And I say, okay, go ahead and do your own inspection, but you're not going to get any repairs or credits for it. Everything that we've found, my inspector is very thorough and he has all the photos and pictures. I mean, sometimes I'm like, geez, do you really have to call that many things out? But he calls everything out because I'd rather have everything on the table, no surprises. And even when the buyers get their own inspection, there's actually usually less on their inspection report than is on my inspection report. So well, you usually include that on your presentation. Like, I think, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying that you basically, when you're doing your listing presentation, you let the seller know upfront, and this is one of the criteria or in they would pay the physical inspection upfront. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because it's really a benefit and I see it that way. And I think that comes across to them that I just, I 100% believe that is in their best interest to do that. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it happened to me with one of my deal where I had to show all of the reports and it went really easy, which is really oh, so much, so much. A lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, good job. Well, it, it's it saved a ton of time, saves a ton of time of this back and forth stuff that constantly wow. is. It was making, repair requests were making me crazy. So I uh -huh. said, how can we get rid of them? Got it, very there smart. Go. Thank you. Smart Thank strategy, you. good stuff. All right, do we have any other questions for Melinda? Yeah, Melinda, I have a question for you. Do you do more listing presentation on Zoom or in person? I would say it's 60% in person, 40% on Zoom. Okay, do you always say- What about the other 10%? 60, 40? 60. Oh, you said 60, I thought you said 50. Yeah, 60, 40. Ah, okay. Yeah. Nobody told Neil math was gonna be involved today. Yeah. <laughs> or, or hearing. Yeah, I wouldn't have been surprised, math Michael. is not. I, I work really well in the big numbers, but not so much in the smaller ones. <laughs> Good job. This okay, Michael. Michael, did you have a question? Yes, I just wanna ask her, she said at the beginning when she was starting, it looked like she built a 500 uh, centers of influence real quick. Uh, you know, she, she can share, I know, I know she got the centers of influence, not all from past clients, this, you know, battle sale, but what, how did you build that 500 so quick? I didn't feel like it was really quick. Um, I think it took me probably eight years to build the 500. So it was one person at a time. Um, but between calling, so I started in 2003, so 2003, then 2007 came. So 2007, I called expireds all day long, every day. Um, 2008, same thing. So even then I started collecting people that I had a good conversation with, but maybe they rented out the property or things like that. Um, and then, um, but I spent a lot of time going to networking events, meeting people. Today, if I walk around, you know, if it wasn't in COVID times and I would go to a movie or I would go to a restaurant, chances are good. I would probably bump into somebody I know. Um, nice. But I built that over the last 18 years. That was not something and, uh, that I did really fast. And, oh, that's nice. And the percentage that you get right now uh, from absentee owners to owner occupy, what is the percentage on your sales? Um, they're usually people that I know, but because I don't specifically target absentee owners right now, uh, unless they're people that I are in my database. Um, but I would say probably only 20% are absentee owners. Okay. Maybe 30. Good, good, good. good. All right, yeah. other questions for Melinda? I have a quick question. Uh, Melinda, first, thank you so much for your time and information you shared with us. Uh, how do you give uh, seller agree after signing the listing agreement or before while you're doing a listing presentation to agree for uh, paying for inspection report? 
Well, the great thing point? is it's right there on the contract. So we, as I'm going through the contract, we just check the boxes and they sign it. Oh, so we're doing it at the same time. Okay, thanks so much. Melinda. Iris, you had a question? Yeah, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Melinda. My question is, uh, do you call your database now? Is it uh, your primary source to call? And also, what do you do uh, for your database to nurture your database? Um, I do call my database now, yes. Um, and um, calling them every day. The I have three different categories, an A, B, and C category. The A people are people who give me referrals on a regular basis or those connector people like my accountant, stuff like that. Bs are almost everybody else. And Cs are people maybe who moved out of state, who don't really keep in touch with people in California anymore. And I sold their house maybe five, six years ago. So I only call them once or twice a year. The A's I call monthly, the B's I call quarterly. That's that's the idea. It's not always perfect, but that's the idea. Other than that, um, I send out a uh, educational video every other week that talks about something. Like I sent out a video about Prop 19. I sent out Shit. different things to people to, um, to educate them. And then um, I'm doing a seminar this Saturday for our clients and um, Neil is going to speak and we're going to talk about building uh, real estate wealth through real estate. So different things like that, but that's pretty much it. Oh, I send, a pen, send postcards four times a year. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Hey, Melinda, is there a particular script um, or situation that you get into that when it happens, it's like, oh my gosh, this is great. And you handle it like, really well is there a particular situation or script that comes up yes one of my favorite is when they're comparing me to other agents and they want to know why they should pay me my full three percent versus somebody else you know who is willing to do it for two percent or whatever um and that is so i love that one because I'm generally getting three or 4% on average for my listings than the other agents. And so I can usually show them how much more money I'm making and it, and it becomes a no brainer for them that I pay for myself. So to, cl to, to, to clarify that just a little bit, you take the statistics in the multiple listing service and compare it to other agents or the multiple listing service and show that uh, on average, you get three to three to 4% more for all of your clients than other agents, correct? Correct, yep. And if it's 4% on an $800,000 piece of property, that, that could be thirty two, dollars $40,000, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, got it, yeah. So when you, when you have that, you do that, and then you close on them. Yeah. And you, you win that at a very high, uh, at a high uh, probability level, right? Well, yeah, if I can find out who I'm competing against and I just bring the statistics, it, it almost makes it a no-brainer for the agents, I mean, for the sellers. Um, and then that, what, what program do you use to keep your database? What do you use for management there? I use Top Producer for 17 and a half years and I'm switching over to a program called Chime right now. And it is a very painful transfer, but it'll be good in the long run. I keep telling what, myself. What is the name? I'm sorry. It's called Chime. Chime? Yeah, I don't recommend changing Yeah, hold on, hold on. Let me be a coach here for a second. No, don't change your whatever database. database you're using, stick yeah. with it. Don't change your database unless you absolutely have to. It's a lot of work. It's going to take me six months to get it up and running properly. <clears throat> don't, 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 please. Don't okay. do it. Yeah, good <laughs> job. Okay, uh, unmute yourselves, please. Unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Let's give her a big hand. Woo! All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melinda. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, there's a couple of requests for a copy of this. Um, we we do make a copy of all of our uh, interviews in Mastermind. And um, Robert, can you post the um, the link 
Um, as soon as someone Venmo's me some money. Huh? <laughs> On it. This is worth money. So uh -huh. <laughs> who wants to pay for it? Okay. Um, all right. Good job, Melinda. Again, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's take a couple of minutes. What did we learn today? What did we learn today? What did you learn today? I'll kick it off. I, I thought it was great when she was saying when she started her business and she was selling her family member, her brother, if I remember correctly. And she said she couldn't sleep for six weeks because she was so worried about doing something wrong. And I thought that was relatable that this is a really important business for other people and their large assets. And so, you know, just taking a risk and going through that fear. And then of course, you know, now it doesn't scare her anymore, but I found that relatable. Yeah, that's great. Good. Okay, what else did we learn today? Hello? I think she, uh, I'll say something. Thanks, Tess. With Melinda, I think she's very, um, how do you say it, very tenacious and really very precise. I want to know what's the personality of Melinda. Melinda's, <laughs> what's your personality style? Is she amiable? amiable? Yeah. Yeah, she's less eight. and less every day. Right. <laughs> Robert says I'm more and more driver every day. Yeah, I thought she was amiable. And that she's a very people person. And I think her client loves her, you know. And, yeah. and that really brings into like what she said, listening to people. When you listen to people, I think it makes a whole lot of difference. You're you're with them. And they feel it. They know when you're just being salesy. Got that's, it. That's a great. No, that's very, very good point. Excellent. Good job. What else did we learn today from Melinda? Very, very important two things. Number one is upfront inspection to avoid negotiation, wasting time and wasting money for the seller, all the disclosures down. And number two is sign future listing. See, I have a one going on. She said she's moving into a new house and she doesn't want to sign when, until later when she moves out. So now I can say, oh, let's sign now. Listing expires after it goes to market active. So sign right. future listing, that's important. Otherwise, who knows, somebody else is gonna take it while you're waiting. And also one thing, I think Melinda is really um, interested in her client's best interest. She really has to look after her client's best interest. That's why he, her clients trust her. No, uh, you picked up on that very well. Good job, Yvonne. Good stuff. Yeah. Josie. Well, she said it, Yvonne said it too, but Melinda, you shared this with us before that you take the listing and then you write in there Listing expires 120 days after, you know, it, after it goes on the market. And I think that's great. I got to remember to do that. I do a lot of listing ahead of time too. And that's a great point. Thank you. Excellent. Good. All right. What else did we learn? Thank you, Melinda. Thank you for amazing information. We, you have a lot of people looking up uh, of what you're doing. We appreciate this very much. Thank you so much, Melinda. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you. Good stuff. All right, what else did we learn? It takes money to make money. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have any in the beginning. I had no money. <laughs> she didn't have borrow money. She had $6,000 and it was borrowed. Right. Eight, and my credit ago. card was maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but now uh, focusing on the fact that we're, uh, we're in sales, that, we're, that our job is sales to get to always be finding new clients. That's, that's a, a really good goal, I think, for everyone. Absolutely. Good stuff. All right, what else? So, so I have one more thing. Go ahead, so, Valerie. One of the things she said that she listened to her everything and did everything her coach said. Hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. D did everyone write that down? I'm surprised Neil didn't <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Everyone write that down? Okay. Melinda is a, and the truth is, Melinda's a, a, a terrific, very 
very, very coachable. Um, and the goals that we wrote down in Las Vegas in that first meeting that we had uh, five years ago, we focused on that and, um, and we didn't, you know, every week there was some conversation on uh, trying to achieve that. And um, there was a, you know, there was a couple setbacks and there was some days it didn't work. And then some days that she didn't think she was ever going to get another listing again, <laughs> but, um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a process and it's over time. And she's just amazingly coachable from mm -hmm. that perspective. Vicki, you had something? You drank both of yours yesterday. I saved mine for this morning. That's a good point. Got to give her that one. <laughs> Can you repeat that again, please? <laughs> no, go ahead, Iris. Oh, what I learned from Melinda, um, besides she has good quality of being amiable, I'm amiable, but, but the thing is, I think uh, um, Melinda successful is because she is goal oriented. She is a very determined and she works hard and she's persistent in order to, to, for her to have such a high achievement. No, that's exactly right, Iris, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So um, I think we let's uh, let's unmute yourselves. Let's give her a big hand one more time. Thank you, Melinda. Woo! All right. All right. All right. Woo! Good stuff.